whole thing and um, um, I love questions and, and interactions so I'm very happy to stop at any time. I think I brought too much actually to go through so I don't have any hope I probably go, you know, if you are interested that I go through the end of it. So maybe because of that I start um, uh, giving you kind of a sense of what this is about. This is really a mixture of three projects. Uh, the first one being really, you know, like groundwork that we do at investment investment banks such as Natixis or clients, you know, clients interested in the Belt and Road, so what is it about, blah, blah, blah. That will be the first part, which if you are really into the subject might be, you know, not very relevant. So I hope I can get to the second and third part of the presentation which is more like uh, actual research work of, of two different natures, uh, which I've conducted uh, with another affiliation that I have at the moment, which is Bruegel, which is a research uh, a think tank in, in Brussels. And, and that uh, second and third paper, um, which are not yet fully written, I'm afraid, but you know, they're, on, 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 they're coming. Uh, second deals with the experiences, and explains the title of the presentation basically. This is Belt and Rock from the European perspective. Um, so it deals with the Marshall Plan and whether there's anything we could learn or you know, any experiences we could draw from that plan for the Belt and Road. And there's been some discussion on actually dispelling that comparison, frankly speaking. So we bring it back. Uh, it's a co-author of mine at the Bank of Italy who is uh, uh, an economic historian, you know, basically bringing that comparison. And, and the third paper is actually an empirical paper uh, with uh, another co-author, uh, Jiang Wei, you, who is now at Bruegel as a research uh, affiliate, uh, looking at uh, bilateral trade and what impact the reduction of transportation costs, be shipping and railway, may have on on, on those, on, on every bilateral trade fair you can imagine, not only Belt and Road ones, but most importantly Europe. So will the Belt and Road strategy help Europe engage, you know, grow, grow its own trade uh, patterns, not only with China but with the rest of the world because of, of uh, lower transportation costs. And, and that, that's kind of the theme of these three uh, different pieces, so they will look quite different, just to warn you uh, as I move along. And again, you uh, stop, you know, I'm happy to stop at any time because I don't know what are your interests out of these three things. So the first very general, uh, you know, she's run plan what is about, what, what is this all about, as uh, the uh, Marshall Plan and again the, the empirical uh, project uh, as third part of the presentation. Um, so, you know, the, the, a lot was written when the, the plan was announced uh, to an extent that the very first name that this thing was given was One Bell, One Road, I O or, and you know, among us um, market economists, the thing went as far as oh, well, like meaning nothing to be found there, not relevant, what a stupid idea, uh, you know, etc. That was really the starting point of the whole thing. And people tend, you know, somehow focus much more on the AIIB as the as as the real thing to to explore. And I think over time, we've probably realized that it might actually be the other way, the other way around. The AIB being an instrument, a financial instrument for the ground plan, which is the Belt and Road. That's I think how people are kind of starting to rewrite the story. Um, so I go through these key drivers for this plan and how much has happened so far because one of the reasons why people say, oh, whoa, is because they think nothing has happened so far. And I think there's already quite some evidence there that things have actually happened. And I'll give you a few examples there already. Um, so, you know, this is very simple. This is just what are we talking about. And to make a long story short, because I have a few issues to, to discuss today here in very little time, you can actually boil it down to two main routes. And, you know, supposedly the name comes from those two main routes, the belt and the road, and 
you know, the maritime route south and the northern route, which is a, basically a railway route for trade, supposedly, and, and, and cooperation. And that cooperation, I leave it there because it's in, in the wording uh, from the Chinese leadership, but very much resounds like the Marshall Plan wording, the cooperation part, the win-win part. Um, so um, moving forward, you know, again, it's very you know uh, rough details that you can find everywhere. So I don't want to uh, spend too much time here. And what are we talking about? It's uh, officially the number of countries under the Belt and Road keep on growing. So the latest is like 63 countries <coughs> plus the 18 countries from European Union that are kind of the end of that road, and you keep on moving. And as we move on. You know, the GDP involved in this project gets larger and larger, also the heterogeneity of, of the whole thing. Uh, but it actually boils down to a lot. And I think that is the first thing to, to realize, and a lot of difficulties on the road because of the heterogeneity. And the lack of, if you want, institutions. You know, there was recently a, a paper by the Peterson Institute discussing this very same project. <laughs> You know, the one and only recommendation for the Chinese government at the end of the whole thing was, oh gosh, build some institutions for this mess, you know, like do something, I don't know, at least a secretariat. That's, uh, you know, as far as I can go. Because it sounds so huge and so complicated. And, and I think that's why many people kind of dispel the whole idea from the very beginning. So, but, uh, so here the argument is maybe it's not really to be dispelled uh, in that way. So the, the reasons in most of us you may have read on the Belt and Road behind the thing started by oh, China wants to export excess capacity to these captive markets, you know. Uh, uh, captive because they receive the financing, you know, everything is there for them to accept that excess capacity under, you know, subsidized if you want conditions. And they actually need they need the infrastructure, they need the stuff, why not? So it's all about China exporting again. You know, it's it's uh, excess capacity. Here is some you know a simple calculation of of uh, you know how much it could be on in, for steel and cement. I, I I there's lots of graphs there. I'm not going to go into all of them, but just as as an idea of uh, the underlying reason, the overcapacity one. Then the other one is more like like more well. If China wants to maintain a certain amount of external demand beyond the overcapacity argument, I mean more generally, uh, and an external demand that we see nowadays that might not be there because you know this low growth uh, environment uh, uh, across the globe, maybe one way to do it is a way to do it is just again the transportation costs, you know, just reduce that and that automatically. Which is the basis for the third paper, by the way. You know, automatically we create some trade, so we compare tariffs to transportation costs, and actually the literature shows so far that transportation costs seem to be, you know, more trade uh, creative if you want, or you know, manage to create more trade than even the reduction of tariffs. So, so with that reasoning in mind, you know, we we basically look at you know, cost of different ways of transportation on how much that could improve under the Belt and Road. Um, and of course, improve because there's a need for that. Yeah, and, and so we compare levels of infrastructure in Asia and, you know, where they all are as compared to certain average to make the point that it is actually needed. Well, this, this point might not be very convincing because you would have to have a kind of an equilibrium level of what kind of infrastructure would pop, but it's just to show that, you know, just this ADB uh, report, which you may have seen, comes up with as much as 8 trillion US dollar in infrastructure needs only in Asia. Uh, so I think we could kind of agree that, you know, there is a need, whether what China is expecting to provide is beyond that need, that's a different, you know, given the amount <coughs> of excess capacity, that's a different story. But, but I think we could basically say that, yeah, this is, in principle, could be a win-win because there is a, a need from the uh, countries, the recipient countries, uh, on that Belt and Road um, route. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that 
would be interesting to know is whether, okay, that's great, so China has excess capacity, wants additional external demand, and have these markets that need it, so why not? So it does seem like a win-win, but then the next question is, where's the money going to come from? You know, if it, it, and, and there, you know, you realize that the first thing, I think, to make this credible beyond the, beyond the oh, whoa, you know, is, okay, show me your money. And that's why I think increasingly uh, there's this perception that maybe all of these new organizations, AIIB, uh, the BRICS, the new development bank, or a very specific one created for that purpose with uh, private seed money, the Silk Road Fund, private public seed money, uh, are just you know these venues for to get the funds to do this. Uh, there is a very nice uh, work done by Dragonomics, which some of you may know about whether this you know official, well-known source of funding, AIB, Briggs Bank, uh, Silk Road, may be even enough, you know, even a start. And of course, the, the answer is no. So they look at the sources of funds from China, from Chinese development banks and the like, whether that would be something that could even accommodate part of that infrastructure need, and the answer is again, no. So they kind of conclude, well, yeah, where's the money going to come from, no matter all of these sources. So that's, of course, a question mark. Um, uh, that we is still there. The other question mark is how, if you want, how, uh, how, how is China going to do this? Is it going to be like China, literally China driven project? Or because we have this AIIB and the BRICS Development Bank, um, this is going to be more inclusive? I, you know, whoever is a shareholder of that bank will have a say in the projects under the Belt and Road. And frankly, you know, when you compare with the World Bank, I mean, it's not very different, the role of the US in the World Bank, I mean, the role, the share of, you know, the shareholder share of the US as opposed to China in both institutions. Um, so one could argue that well, maybe, yes, there will be a, a role for the rest of the shareholders to, to set the agenda, but but remember, this is only one of the very many sources of funding for this humongous project. So that doesn't really guarantee that this is going to be a fair place because this is only one of the very many sources of funding. And, and again, being the Belgrade Road, a much bigger project to my mind than what the AAB can ever do on, on its own. Um, and then the other thing, just really like a taster for the Marshall Plan uh, issue is beyond the, if you want, the word is not very nice, but dumping the excess capacity, if I may, and creating additional external demand, and the fact that, yeah, maybe we don't know where all of the financing will come from, but at least we have a pie there that not, not every country in the world can, you know, show. The, uh, uh, so. Beyond all of that, there's another probably objective, uh, secondary or, or so, but still relevant, which is you know, internationalizing the RMB. And you may wonder, well, but why, why through this Belt and Road? I mean, we have this nice uh, offshore market in Hong Kong, replicated in Hong Kong, in Singapore, even in Taiwan for that matter. I mean, why would this be a better way to, and, and I think probably, um, we're again back to the Marshall Plan story that I move back uh, move uh, to in a minute, which is, you know, it's actually much more comfortable to internationalize a current the currency in in a backyard if you think about it because you can decide how, when, and at what price. So you know, if you can invoice your infrastructure projects, uh, you can use your own payment system. SIPs or, you know, it's something that you can control much better than, you know, a CNH, uh, you know, uh, slightly too large difference between CNH and CNY that may distort the view of your currency for the rest of the world. So it's much less market driven, if you want, or much less, much less dependent on the opening of the capital account for that matter, or, or things that are more, you know, beyond your control, basically. So this is why I think there is really 
a plan behind that relates to what I would call an engineered or controlled in industrialization of the currency behind this project. And you can tell because you know the very first um, loans that the AIB has announced, some have not necessarily yet happened because the first announcement was Indonesia, the renminbi denominated loan, and then it ended up being a different country. But for for the purpose of the discussion now, it was a renminbi denominated loan. <laughs> you know, with a, with a bank that has or not yet, but will have 100 billion US dollar of capital. So you know, there's an issue of, well, you know, you, this is the engine of having you know cross-border renminbi loans which were very hard to get in the offshore market, as we all know. So, and, so it, is, it, it is a much more engineered and controlled way to do this than what they had figured out before, which, by the way, will have perhaps consequences for Hong Kong, whether positive or, or negative. We can discuss it in the Q&A. But I think it's a very interesting aspect of the Belt and Road that might, be, might not be as, uh, I mean, might be overlooked sometimes. So. Um, so how much so far? Here, this is just what well, we've kind of um, looked at all of the projects that, I mean, investments in the key countries under the Belt and Road in the areas of interest, mainly uh, transport infrastructure or energy, mm -hmm. and look at you know how big they've been. As you see, Russia has been the key winner so far. Um, and you know, then you have another second key winner, which is hidden in the group, which is Pakistan, basically. Uh, 44 billion, out of which 26 apparently has already, have already been disbursed. So we're talking about disbursement here, not announcements. So yeah, there is a reality out there. Uh, if, if I concentrate on, on for example, actual uh, transportation projects, you know that. Chengdu Duisburg train, which started, I mean, railway route, which started in 2011, is already finished. And, and so you see that it's not just announcing stuff, uh, but it's actually happening. So, so that's why I, I tend to disagree with this idea of, you know, just a dream and, and no substance uh, whatsoever. So yeah, uh, second thing, I'll try to move faster. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them before I move to the so you just sure. mentioned that railway from Chengdu to where? Uh, Duisburg in Germany. Yeah, I can, uh, for whoever is interested, um, there is, I think, a map thereafter on, you know, the key routes, and then up for each route there is a number of lines. As many, I think, as 16 lines, we went through, you know, all of the news in China to for, for the third project to count the different lines and how they would look. Um, so that's the very first which started and has been finalized, but there are other routes that are being, uh, still in, you know, in, in, construct, in construct, construction. Sorry. So, yeah. Charles, we know that So, if your question is whether <coughs> this project will make China's uh, public uh, debt uh, bigger, if that's the question, I, of course, think so, <laughs> because whether it's a Chinese, you know, China Development Bank, at the end of the day, these banks are recapitalized. Uh, on the very same specific case of that bank, which is massive on on, on these kind of projects, I think as late as June 2015 out of the uh, official uh, you know, uh, forex reserves. So yes, uh, the, 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 it's not only for the deficit, but even for the, for the reserves. Uh, so because of the way Chinese banks have been recapitalized since the early 2000s. So, so the answer is yes, this is going to have an impact. But the question is how much growth uh, through you know, exports can this bring to China? Uh, exports of goods and services because this is infrastructure projects. The engineers are going there. Not only the engineers, I mean, like literally everybody is going there, and uh, and 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 therefore this is a source of revenue as well. Uh, 
So, you know, it's hard to tell whether this is... Uh, yes, it does have a fiscal impact, I agree, but it also brings something else to the table for China. is that a lot of that land will have to be, you know, captured for the railway projects and uh, among others, yeah, because there will be additional urbanization across that uh, route that, that will have to happen. And that's already in the five-year plan. We have these hundred million people to be moved to. I think part of that will be really along the way. Um, so, so that will have consequences. That's all I can tell you. I, I really don't, you know, I can't really dwell on that question any further. So, yeah. Yeah, like, why is the emphasis on railroads instead of roads? Like, Sorry? Uh, like As opposed to road, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, because this is fast speed, uh, fast speed railway, yeah. uh, which is the only way for... Okay, so I, I will come back to your question thereafter because there's a very interesting issue about how China's trade transportation differs to a good part of the rest of the world. And, and that, you know, I will uh, answer your question then. So very quickly, um, this may look superficial because I really can't dwell with it uh, too much, uh, but just to give you a sense of why the Marshall Plan would be an interesting concept to think about. When, or, or, not that it will have to be, it, will be the same, but at least it shows that when you create such a huge master plan, it may end up being something very different than what you originally had in mind because of the you know huge consequences for so many countries. And um, so, so for some, as I mentioned, this is an unwarranted comparison. So if you're one of them, you know, bear with me. I'll get to the third session very soon. But, but if you are interested in this comparison, well, and, and the reason why, you know, especially Chinese uh, academics, um, I attended a conference only on this topic and, you know, they kind of dispelled the idea because they see the criticism of, you know, creating a backyard as the U.S. did with Europe, you know, confronting the Soviet Union and the military aspect of it and, you know, and, and it kind of gets in, 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 you know, in a territory that probably is not very, you know, they don't feel very comfortable with. Um, and because probably, you know, to, to their credit, that's not the original reason why the Belt and Road has been created. But I'm just arguing here that when one looks at economic history, why uh, the Marshall Plan was originally created, it wasn't also, it wasn't a security reason, it became a security reason. Um, so, so it was more about, you know, you are in bits and pieces, uh, let's, uh, bring you together. Let's bring you together. Let's bring Europe together. Let's give you some funds to cooperate. And you can ar argue that, you know, maybe that is also true for China, you know, South China Sea, blah, 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 other, you know, like uh, uh, issues there that could possibly justify, uh, you know, funds for that area to become more integrated and less conflict driven or, you know, conflict prone more than conflict driven. So, so I, I see that the starting point is actually maybe not so so difficult, so different. Also, frankly speaking, uh, Europe ran a huge deficit after the Second World War with the U.S. You know, importing all kinds of things from machinery. Into, so, so even that part is not too different. Uh, but it, again, it then became something different, which is what we don't know whether will be the case for the Belt and Road, more of security and military protection against the Soviet Union or, you know, like a, um, a, a backyard, if you want, uh, in, uh, uh, across the Atlantic. And that happened only two years. So the, the interesting thing is it only took two years for the Marshall Plan to become something or to head towards a different direction. So from 1948 to 1950. Um, 
And this, well, the, the, you know, the paper explains why this was the case and the role of the military and military spending. And military spending. So you can think about China maybe, you know, contemplating that idea as well. And, and that's why I'm saying, well, this might not be the reality today, but it could eventually become a reality. And when one looks at, uh, uh, you know, exports of, of uh, uh, defense, you know, from China to Pakistan, you can start, you know, making some, uh, uh, you know, some relation to this idea, which might not be as generalized as to argue that it will end up in the same way, but, you know, it has some flair, some, some flavor of it already now. Um, so uh, the other thing that the Marshall Plan really wanted to do is, here you are, I give you these funds, uh, but you cooperate, and then you are on your own. I'm not going to stay here forever. I'm not going to stay here forever for you. And I'm forced to coordinate and create multilateral uh, institutions. This is why I was referring to this paper by the Peterson Institute, which is probably very influenced by this idea that the better world today needs some institutional uh, background to, to <coughs> go on, which is not yet there. And frankly, Asia has a very little you know, history of creating those institutions compared to uh, Europe, even Latin America, although they are uh, not functioning, but they exist. Uh, so the question is, will that thing that happened in Europe be replicated in Asia under the Belt and Road is a big question mark. Um, the other thing is uh, the idea of the payment system that I, w I was referring to before. So uh, after the Second World War, Europe had literally no uh, cross-border payment capability and part of the Marshall Plan was you know to create that to really integrate the payment system uh, in Europe uh, to allow for currency convertibility you know and all of the Bretton Woods uh, 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 aspect of that and frankly it went all the way so that's you know we, we, the BIS was set up then and, and the BIS was the secretariat for many many years to the embryo of European Monetary Union. So it started from having literally no currency convertibility across countries to you know, a full-fledged Monetary Union. And of course, Europe's case is very special, it might not even last, but the, the point I wanted to make here is that the, the Marshall Plan does show that financing and cooperation can bring a currency uh, to its international use. Um, and that, that is very powerful in the, in the comparison with the Belt and Road. So, um, again, SIPs, as you probably know, you know this, this international payment system that China has uh, uh, established, opened up last year. You can think that of as, if not a substitute, which is a big word, but a complementary, one day it needed a substitute to SWIFT. And, and that system is, you know, I know from the largest uh, bank in Pakistan that, you know, that is what they are using massively for all of the infrastructure uh, financing. And, and I think that tells a lot as to, beyond the currency, what this is about. Yeah, it's about creating really your own independent cross-border payment system not very different from, from what happened uh, during the Marshall uh, Plan. Um, so now the problem was that because of the Marshall Plan, of course, Europe got encapsulated in, in this Atlantic uh, problem or solution because, you know, of what happened later, next. But the truth is that it became part of this Atlantic alliance. NATO was great. I mean, the whole thing became a security issue. So. The question mark there is, will that happen uh, again? And is this a reason, underlying reason, for uh, China to have moved ahead from the Belt and Road, you know, in response to the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, and beyond, really, beyond the trade uh, issues. Uh, uh, so so that that's what, you know, one of the things that resonates when we read about the Marshall Plan and what it meant. So all in all, um, so I guess we, 
you know, the key, the key takeaway here is that the European experience with the Marshall Plan indicates that the ro better road, not that it is now, but it could become more than, you know, more than a device for ex exporting your excess capacity, which is already quite nice, but, you know, beyond that, it could really create a backyard, if you want, a backyard in terms of your payments, the currency of your payments, eventually, potentially security, and that is a very different ballgame than what we have in mind today when we say, oh, well, who cares? You know, it, it, so, so that's the experience, and it happened in very few years. It, you know, it transformed itself. Of course, the threat of uh, the Soviet Union was increasingly strong, and, and that might not be the case now, although some could argue that you know, we, we are certainly not in the best uh, times ever in terms of uh, bilateral relations with, between the US and China. But, that's a different topic. So, if there are no questions, I will to the third part of the presentation. Yeah. I have one question which yeah. uh, relates to the earlier issue of who's going to pay. Yeah. And I'm wondering in the Marshall Plan, was a lot of the financing coming from the U.S. aid to Europe? Yeah. Um, and is there similarly an envisioned aid component to mm. China's, yeah. how China's going to help these countries uh, provide uh, financing for Yeah. So whether it's aid or loans, is that what you mean? Or, I mean, how much is concessional or? Right, concessional or OK, what because the, the way China yeah. understands aid, and there may be some expert in the audience who knows much more about this than me, is very different from how the West understands aid. Yeah, so, so to start from you know, that point of view. Um, and the Marshall Plan wasn't really aid in the way the West understands aid today. Uh, so. So there were a lot of commercial, you know, like um, uh, commercial interests linked to the to the funds uh, that were received by European countries, um, and and there were a lot of political uh, underpinning for a country to receive or not to receive. Say, you know, from Spain, Spain received zero because it was under, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, right-wing uh, uh, dictatorship, to, to use that word. Sometimes it's hard to use, but that's the word we should use. And, and, and therefore, you know, you can argue that yeah, aid might be driven you know, by political issues too, but it was really like commercial and you know, pinpointing where the money had to go, depending on how close the alliance was to the U.S. interests or the U.S. Uh, uh, political uh, interest, if you want. So in, in the case of uh, China, I think there is probably part of that, but also I think the concessional part of your question is more like, is this something that is going to use up part of the excess capacity that I have, which is already a win for me because you know we all know <laughs> what is the macro consequence of all of that, you know, prices coming down, wholesale prices being highly negative in China. I mean, so let's put it there. Whether it's concessional, I couldn't care less because anyway, it's depressing my economy. So, so it's, it's really so far, I, I think, more of a still commercial driven, you know, uh, than, than it, the Marshall Plan was. But the question is, will it become more uh, politically driven uh, and security driven? Uh, as was the case of the Marshall Plan, I think that very much depends on the bilateral <coughs> relations between the U.S. And, and China. So the the more difficult that becomes, the more China will push for that security-driven master plan rather than ec economically driven master plan. Th that's I think what we learn from the Marshall Plan, from its origin to its transformation. Yeah. Yeah, but it, of course it's uh, <coughs> certainly, uh, you know, all of these loans are to a large extent uh, below market price, well below market price. And, and there's a study on Pakistan that shows that very clearly with microdata on the, on the loans. It, I don't think this is a, an economic publication, it's a bank thing that, you know, showing that. It, and, and just to make the case that it's very hard for so I think it's a European bank. I can't remember that for for cross-border lending, 
into that part of the world to really get anywhere because you can't compete uh, on the because of the cost of capital but also because you know the actual market price not being there yeah so yeah oh, I'm interested to about the internalization of R&D as you mentioned yeah. uh, I think there are a lot of obstacles given China's attitude with like open corporation and China is not the sole founder of the whole project so how can like how can this contribute to the internal um, mm -hmm. internationalization and to what extent can it okay. really achieve Okay, so it all depends on how you uh, define internationalization because for many, in internationalization of the RMB equals capital account liberalization, meaning you have a fully convertible currency, uh, you know, and funds can move in and out of China anytime. So if you have that definition, maybe this is off uh, topic. But I'm talking here about the share, the share of all kinds of transactions, be it, you know, trade invoicing, uh, trade settlement, uh, um, it could be, you know, like outward FDI, you know, if, if they buy whatever corporation in your uh, local currency, it could be um, a payment of uh, services in RMB. So all of that settlement type of thing, which is what SWIFT measures uh, very accurately as of today, soon we'll have to have six and SWIFT they coupled together to, to have that because of the growth of that parallel payment system. But uh, to make a long story short, it's about the use. It's not necessarily about the free use of the currency, no matter what the SDR definition is. Uh, it's about the use. So this is forced in the use. You want my whatever? Uh, but you know, uh, I want uh, to pay in renminbi, and then with that renminbi, you pay me back for my for your imports from China. And you know, it's the usual kind of trade, but extended trade, like it could be services. You know, it, it anything between bilateral between those two countries could be invoiced and settled in renminbi. So in that regard, is using the renminbi internationally, but it's not the old idea of you know, capital account liberalization, old or new, but it, it goes beyond that. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I have very little time left, which is good because this paper is not like, you know, uh, we keep on writing regression, so whatever I show you, I hope is in the final version, but um, no, I can't guarantee. Um, so it, it's about the trade aspect, and this is because you know, as a European, and I, I feel like, what well, this train is going all the way to Duisburg. Uh, there's one more going to Vienna. There's a, like sub routes, and you know, it's like, yeah. is this going to have any impact on us, which we desperately need, by the way. So, you know, this idea of oh, the end of the road. I mean, what what is this? And 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 Europe being absolutely export driven. You know, uh, well, what is this? For us, what does this mean for us? So, so I thought, okay, uh, why not start <coughs> looking at the existing uh, political literature? And of course, the first thing you confront is what literature, because these roles are not yet there. <laughs> and you know, anything you do can only be, you know, this is the current um, importance, say, of transportation costs, and you simulate what will happen if those transportation costs are reduced. So that's what we do here. Um, I don't. I don't. I won't get into the details because I didn't. Ex this. I didn't expect this to be like a fully academic seminar. I saw so many people here, so I spare. You know the details. Whoever's interested, I'm happy to. I'll be happy to discuss that with you. Uh, but the whole idea was uh, exactly that. Once I know how relevant are transportation costs for uh, uh, bilateral trade as opposed to other variables, of course, in the, in the usual gravity model. Uh, and I know, I have a sense of how much they will be reduced, both in time and cost. Um, what is it? That who, I mean, how much do we gain in terms of global trade? Uh, glo globally, country by country, but you know, the, is there a gain? Is everybody gaining? Who is losing? So that, that's the, the, the theme here of this paper. 
And um, as I said, and so we desperately looked for literature because I, we thought, okay, at least for the belt, because we're going to the end of the road. We're outside the 63 countries of relevance here. So we're looking at Germany. I mean, we, we have everybody there. But at the beginning, we thought we would have a sense of how much, say, Pakistan would win, uh, would get out of this. And the, the reality is that we couldn't find any empirical uh, analysis whatsoever. So I thought, wow, I mean, they're doing all of this, but nobody has actually come up with the, what the gains are going to be, at least trade-wise. And, and I was very surprised by that, frankly. Um, so yeah, so I'll focus basically on, on trade and transportation cost, maritime and railway. Again, the northern route and the southern route. Let me tell you that uh, most people look at these routes as separate animals. And the whole idea of the paper is not to do that because the minute, say, railway costs come down massively, <coughs> there could be substitution. Uh, you know, the, the whatever the... the um, container that goes now all the way to the south of Spain might no longer go all the way to the south of Spain and just, you know, use the northern route. Uh, for most practitioners, I, I was at a maritime, uh, you know, regional conference this morning talking about the Belt and Road and the, all the shipping industry says, no way, we're far more competitive, this will never happen, there's no population on the northern road, there will be no substitution, maybe, because we, I only run empirical exercise and they know more than me, but I tell you, according to what we find, there is just based on at least the estimates of reduction of railway costs, which might not be accurate because this comes from, you know, like local officials, uh, you know, like uh, uh, very proudly uh, saying it will be 50% less and so on, but nobody really knows because they are highly subsidized, by the way, this, this the existing route is highly subsidized. So. Whether that's sustainable, we don't know. Uh, but the truth is that based on their estimates of reduction of cost, we find that there would be substitution uh, from the shipping to... So, so I, you know, again, whoever is not into trade transportation, just, you know, as I wasn't before I went into, the, into this project, I had no idea that, uh, you know, the, the huge differences in cost either than air, you know, by mere common sense, but Really, you know, that railway is medium price, the road thing is the cheap one, the one that Europe uses massively, and shipping is, is cheap but very slow. So, okay, so once we know that, as I said, you know, the, the uh, China is pushing for both. It's not really, I don't think China is really like getting into this game of substitution. It's only something that may happen, but, but they are developing both. This is the what they call the stream of a stream of pearls, all of the ports that are being built, um, you know, in, in, in the, in basically in the Bay of Bengal and, and how that will change, you know, uh, uh, trade relations there. But it's just for, you know, to give you a sense of how many ports are being built. It's not that there's only a railway project or, and this is the famous railway thing that I wanted to show you. So the, the yellow one is really this uh, silk, route that is being built. Uh, then there is, you know, other routes that are being built that are better known, you know, the, 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 this one is, you know, actually started before even the Belt and Road had been announced. So there's a lot of other things going on, you know, connecting uh, the Mekong uh, region. And, but all in all, you know, the very new thing is this, and there's like sub routes sub lines if you want within that that you know move from here then so I didn't I didn't want to bore you too much with that but basically the key idea here is will this be a substitute you know for shipping uh, transportation um, and again the reason why I came up to think that there could be some is that the models for transportation are very different across regions Europe is mainly road uh, maritime is 32%, but China's maritime, this is e export, this is imports, but it's about the same, is is 60%. So it's, it's um, road is, is, you know, very, very limited, and rail is hardly in existence. So the question is, could that ever change with the new routes? Um, so why, why, uh, so 
I don't know whether any Chinese leaders, no matter how clever, ever thought about this, but I thought, wow, uh, you know, it, again, nothing that I knew before I started this project, but I thought, wow, well, transportation costs are actually much more powerful in creating trade than tariffs. So there you go, you, you know, you negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership for years, and you're exhausted by the time you get to Congress, and nobody wants to approve it, and, and then, you know, these guys, by building things, you know, ports and, and, and railway thing, and they get a bigger impact on trade than if they had reduced the tariffs. So it's like, wow, you know, it's like really interesting. And, and so just to give you an idea, this is, uh, uh, you know, who else, uh, uh, apparently I didn't know about it before, but again, famous piece on, on uh, American government review showing that uh, each, so for each day less in transit, it's like about, it could be all the way to 2% reduction in tariffs. So, so that gives you, you know, a sense of relevance. Yeah? And, um, you know, there's a lot of other uh, calculations in the paper of how this compares. So this is what we do. It's a, a very simple uh, uh, gravity thing. We do, however, take into account for whoever's into gravity models of, you know, the kind of subsidiary effect. So if there is substitution, you know, of, I mean, there could be substitution of, so two bilateral pairs could affect other pairs. So, so we take that into account, which reduces by the way massively the positive impact of, on trade off of the reduction of transportation costs, which, which is something that you would imagine based on, I mean, very much in line with the existing literature. But having said that, um, just, you know, the, the, the bulk of the story is that 1% reduction in air and rail transportation costs. Sorry, it should be shipping uh, to my dismay, but I made a mistake. Um, can basically lead to as little, and this is taking into account this, you know, other pairs, as, you know, 0.1 percentage points of trade. So basically, when you take into account all of the different effects, it's rather limited. But once you look into the pairs, that's where the story comes, which I will show you here. So this is the top winners and the top losers. Uh, these are, I think, uh, you know, European, the way Europeans would write acronyms that might be yet yeah, Deutschland is Germany and we use, you know, the real name. Uh, so it might be hard for you to follow, but this is how much trade is created from, say, France with the rest of the world. So it's 10% increase in trade. Uh, Germany, like 9%, etc. Belgium, blah, blah, blah. Russia is there quite significantly, as you can imagine, because of the railway reduction of, you know, that affects Russia more than others. And then you have other losers that, you know, are like, um, you know, Afghanistan, Israel, etc. That, in a way, shows you, and, and we have the separate regressions with shipping only, with railway on, only. The story basically lies in that substitution. Because the reduction in shipping costs is much more moderate than the reduction in um, in railway cost, which explains the results. And as you can imagine, as I move along, and I don't know whether I actually put that in, in the final presentation, there are also countries outside this extended concept of Europe, which goes all the way to, you know, uh, Georgia, <coughs> you know, all the way to Pakistan. It's no longer Europe, but say US is the largest uh, uh, loser, Canada, Australia, so all of those that don't benefit from that huge reduction in land transportation, mainly railway. Uh, this is the same thing, but only trade with China. So the rest was trade with the rest of the world, as much as 10% in, uh, uh, increase. This is, say, Belgium with China, as much as nearly 35% increase because of the reduction in transportation costs. And this is by region, so this is the impact on European countries. So with the rest of the world, a 7% increase. This is only with China, so about the same. And, and Asia and so, and so forth, which you would have imagined would have been the largest winners. Because again, the, and this is of course a big assumption because we don't know whether railway transportation will actually, I mean the cost will actually fall as much as they are arguing it will. Yeah, so it is a big, so I'm not, telling you to buy the results. But I think the key is not whether this will happen, but more like, yes, transportation costs are very relevant. 
they can have very, depending on the relation between the reduction in shipping costs as opposed to railway, things could happen along the way as to, you know, a very different picture for China's, uh, if you want, the way China transport is trade today, and, and also, therefore, big consequences for Europe. Yeah. I don't see India in this in, It's not part of the not part of this Belt and Road, mm. officially, which is interesting. Yeah, it's, which is interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the prospect of railways crossing Eurasia was something that troubled the sleep of British politicians about 100 years ago. Because yeah. once Russia could move goods around its heartland, uh, it was no longer vulnerable to blockade. And you mentioned export or overcapacity as being one rationale yeah. behind um, the scheme, but what about the need to secure inland routes for necessary imports, raw materials, oil, um, yeah, yeah. agricultural course. supplies? Of course, of course, of course. This is not in one direction, it's in two directions. The, the usual way, and I should have said that from the beginning, uh, which is a very good comment, uh, that people read the northern route is for imports and the southern route for exports. That's the way. But I'm a little bit like challenging that idea because Again, based on the fact that the, tra the railway transportation costs might actually come down aggressively. Whether it's subsidized or not, at a certain point, frankly, until uh, the fiscal doesn't become like really, really shaky, I don't care. <laughs> as long as, you know, uh, somebody benefits from that and trade is created. So, to, to your point is yes, in principle, the whole idea was this is only for imports of raw materials, blah, blah, blah. And, you know the southern route, which is where the population is, and I, and I, I had this discussion today on, on on this issue of, you know, the, the common theme is the population is only, you know, down there, and up there, you know, we have Astana in the middle of nowhere, and well, but you know, it goes all the way to Europe. So you have 400 million people uh, as of today there. You have Turkey, you have Russia. I mean, it's not like irrelevant. It's irrelevant because. It so happens that south there, you know, yeah, it's probably the most populated part of the world. So, you know, you, it's hard to compete. But it's not that it's irrelevant. It's not that it's irrelevant. So, so I'm a little bit like agreeing with you, challenging the idea that it's only for that purpose. Uh, that, that's all. And on the UK, by the way, UK is one of the losers. Uh, I'm not sure whether I put that in. But, and again, the reason is the, the power Europe, again, uh, the, 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 based on the estimates of the reduction of cost, the power of the railway transportation. This could be, again, proof wrong, but th that's all. Um, so do I have something else? Uh, well, you know, basically that uh, although Europe was kind of not in the picture when we talk about the better road, this only shows that maybe it should be because there could be big pay gains to be made by Europe. Um, uh, and that is very, of course, heterogeneous across countries. Um, so, so yeah, uh, all in all, I think what I wanted to bring here, you know, in, with very different pieces and bits is that, you know, the idea that this is an irrelevant project, I think, is, it doesn't really hold. It could have helped maybe a few years ago, but I think as of today, it's quite obvious that uh, this is, this is, Started and 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 so and frankly, the Chinese have been doing things before they even announced the Belt and Road. So I'm sure they thought about this. There was even this discussion of oh, because they were going through you know difficult, but they came up with this like out of and and if you look at what they had been doing even before the official announcement, to me it sounds like this was a well thought plan, and it was not just a like a like a like a childish kind of reaction to the Trans Pacific Partnership. There may be you know, a, a relation between the two, as I explained, but I don't think it was just, you know, uh, an, uh, a not well thought reaction. I think it is a, a very, uh, a grand plan in, 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 in the sense uh, of the real sense of the word. Um, so so it, it, the, the key issues here beyond the excess capacity story and the commodities is the search for external demand, given that you know what we see in the developed world is really quite uh, you know gloomy, 
those are the markets, so those are the EM markets, China already today exports nearly 30% to the EM universe, which is really their largest market. So how to make them more captive to only you? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's uh, I think, part of this. Of course, when you build a road, the road is there for everybody. Yeah? So that's the European part of the story, that you benefit from the road that has been built. So not that they can capture all of that you know, exclusively, as we see in the results, the trade results, uh, but on the other hand, because you know, there's part of that that is, say, infrastructure building or you know, all of the service related, the renminbi part of the story makes that a way to capture as much as you can, if you think about it, yeah, beyond the, the actual road. So that's why I think the cars is also very relevant in this story. And that's all from my side, so happy to take it's five o'clock. I don't know whether we have time for yeah, yeah, yeah. So, my name is Peter. Yeah, just a quick one. Yeah. Is this about changing the political poles of the world or the economic poles of the world? So, I don't know, but based on the Marshall Plan, what I would argue is that maybe you start changing the economic poles of the world and then you end up changing the political poles of the world because it's so interrelated. And think about the countries on the Belt and Road. I mean, think about the different animals there. I mean, is, how can you argue that this is only going to be economic? It's very hard for me to see that. And, and that's when you know, I read about the Marshall Plan that you know, kind of, I felt that there could be such a transformation. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, relates increasingly, I don't know, the, maybe, I mean, this, the southern part, you could argue, you know, get, get to better terms with your neighbors kind of story. But the, the northern part is a different animal. It's really about security of resources, getting into a real backyard for your growth to be sustainable. It's very hard to think about that without security. Uh, First of all, thank you very much. This is very informative. Um, from the political and military point of view, wouldn't this leave the, the road quite vulnerable in the event of a military conflict? Because they could just bomb a section of road and knock out the whole road. Whereas sea routes, at least you can maneuver. Um, well, and I guess that is part of the reason why they have two roads. This is, again, why I think this is really well thought. Because well, part of the stream of pearls is really to avoid the Strait of Malacca. I mean, it's really thought in that security plus way. Uh, and yes, uh, but this is true for any railway uh, link. So, you know, the fact that they're building the thing to have like, you know, buffers or, or, or uh, parallel routes makes me think that that's part of the equation, surely. Um, uh, in the very same way as the payment system is part of that security equation. Think about Russia, you know, with sanctions and having a nice parallel payment system at their disposal now for, for a good part of their transactions. It's the very same story. I mean, it, it's, it's not bombing, but it's, uh, it's, it's very much, sec it could be very much security driven as well. Yeah. I have question. Here and then last one over So if we now make it cheaper to import gas from Russia, will that affect you know, the energy, poly, uh, energy strategy in China as to you know, uh, say secure less gas domestically because of the uh, less uh, you know, lowering the relative cost of, of imports? Is that what you're asking? Is that what the... Yes, I don't know if there are any influence. I, I mean, again, that of course is the, the theme, but you know, when one looks at what has been, uh, I mean, the 
conclusions of the uh, 13 five year plan <laughs> I, I'm a little bit doubtful about that really about that cost aspect being the driver because they've said very clearly no you know I, I'd rather first uh, take mine and you know even if I'm, I'm making imports cheaper through those roads I'm still you know going to deal with so so in that specific case, I don't think that the imports will substitute whatever can be you know, obtained domestically, frankly. Um, and that's why I also think that a lot is actually on the export side, on the export side of the equation, more than only you know, uh, uh, capturing uh, or reducing the cost of, of securing uh, com uh, commodities. Uh, has there ever been announced uh, a time frame of this whole uh, bell and roll uh, initiative, let's say by 2050 or 2060, yeah. China or whoever would like to achieve this, yeah. this, this, this? Yeah, uh, well, uh, you know, the Bell and Road document, which I don't uh, recommend to any of you <laughs> because it's really, uh, in Spanish we say ladrillo, a brick, you know, a brick thing. Uh, and uh, to, to build the brick, uh, you know, all of what they want to build. But, you know, there's lots of targets there. But I think your question is very well taken because, but that's, you know, I'm not a political scientist. I'm sure there is people here who know more than me about it. But to me, and this is just my own, you know, uh, intuition, if you want, it sounds like they don't want to put a deadline. I really think they, why? Because, again, the, and this is why I don't think it's going to be like the Marshall Plan. I bring the Marshall Plan you know, here because I think it's interesting to compare, but I think this is more of a structural um, project. Because the minute you have the road, uh, you know, you have a strategic relation with whatever country and main eventually, you know, there are 63, so you, you may be able to choose among them, not that all of them have to be there. And, uh, you know, there are venues for that uh, existing uh, new Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, but there are many others that could be built uh, uh, along that. So why put a deadline? I would put a deadline if my objective were only dump the excess capacity. <laughs> First, of course, I may not be, you know, too open in saying this uh, in public because it may not look like a win-win uh, but 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 it's not only about that it's that maybe this is goes beyond that objective and and the other thing is if i think about and the, this I, I don't know whether i should dare say this because I, I don't know whether i'm even in the capacity but i will which is if i were cgp why would i put it that like, this is my grand plan you know, I push as I go. I don't know how far it can go. I don't want to be ne necessarily, you know, like tested every year. So, well. But as we move along, this becomes a reality because I tell you, if I had come here three years ago, you, maybe I wouldn't have even, you know, had these thoughts. But if I had, maybe you would have laughed at me. Meaning, for a long time, nobody took it seriously. So. I don't think it's in his interest, really. I, I think, on, on, on the contrary, this proves to be a, a relevant project. The longer it lasts, the better, because that will, you know, empower him. So you can put deadlines on, you know, specifics like when I'm going to finish that port in the stream of pearls. But I wouldn't put a deadline on the project because this is a project to stay. This is going to change China's view of the world. I mean. Literally, the map, even. I mean, everything. So maybe it's on purpose, basically, that there's no deadline to finish something that you want to continue for a long time or even forever. Yeah. Thank you. If you have a question and it wasn't answered, I encourage you to move the conversation upstairs to the fifth floor and join the happy hour, and you'll maybe I have a chance to ask a question. Um, but uh, let me close the seminar here and thank Alicia.